Okay, according to the uh, big clock on the wall, it is now 1.15. Is this the, peop is this the time when the class is officially supposed to start? Okay, 1.15. Um, uh, when it's 1.15 on the big clock, that's when we're going to start. Um, my name is Steve Skeena. I am uh, the uh, professor this, for this course, which is CSE 373, the uh, analysis of algorithms. Um, and it's, it's good to see a live classroom again. I'm sorry we've got masks here. Uh, masks are going to be taken seriously, so, uh, you know, I'm going to wear one, and so are you guys. Um, and we want noses covered and, and mouth covered and all that kind of stuff. But hopefully we're going to be able to have a, uh, a reasonable in-class uh, experience this year, and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, so, okay, so what I'm gonna, now going to read off of is the syllabus, which is on our course web page. What is the course web page? The course web page is www.cs.stonybrook.edu slash tilde skeena, S-K-I-E-N-A slash 373. And that's the major course website. That's where you'll find all the homework assignments. That's where you're going to find the um, syllabus, a lecture schedule, the lecture notes, everything. OK? So that's where I encourage you guys to, to look at. Um, I'm going to read some stuff off the syllabus now, just for, uh, you know, um, just to, uh, you know, but I want you guys to check it at some point, just to make sure first we're going to do the course mechanics. Um, as far as prerequisites for this course, you should have the data structures course, um, 214. And I believe linear algebra is a requirement, okay, or at least a suggestion or something like that. I really care about the data structures thing. So um, if you haven't had, some people um, sometimes take this course without having the data, da un, you know, undergrad data structures. And unless they, they, have, they, they know that material, they can, have, they can get into trouble, okay? So, um, you know, don't try to dodge that prerequisite. Hopefully, the university won't let you do it, okay? But that, I think, is an important thing for people to know for general maturity. I'm going to kind of be assuming that. Um, the textbook that we're going to use is the third edition of this book, The Algorithm Design Manual. I think this is a great book, okay? One reason I think it's a great book is that I wrote it, okay? And not only did I write it, I wrote it three times. This is the third edition. And you guys will be the first class that I'm teaching to use the third edition. The good news is I think the third edition is better than the previous editions, okay? It has, uh, you know, all the figures are have been rethought or are in color, the expositions, the bugs, a lot of the bugs have been removed. Um, there's more material in certain places, there's better exposition in certain places. So I am, I am quite happy with this book, this, this edition. Um, and this is where, this is we, we're going to use. Um, I inc strongly encourage you to get, get it, your hands on a copy. Because um, the home problems, homework problems will come from the book. Um, there are readings on, the, if you look at the lecture schedule, there will be readings for every class period. Um, the readings are going to cover, you know, co cover the stuff that we talk to, about in class. But I do believe that algorithms is an area where you really need to learn to think in a, diff in a, in a right way. And it's not the kind of thing you can learn by Googling stack, stack Overflow or something like that. Um, and I do think that learning something from a book is a very good way to learn, you know, learn a deep material, learn a subject. So, um, so I am going to strongly recommend, I mean, it's, it's officially the required textbook. I'm going to strongly recommend one way or another you guys get a copy of this thing. Any questions? Okay. Yes. We can get a copy. Amazon, Bill, Jeff Bezos will be very happy to sell you a copy. Okay. And, uh, you know, that's that. I'm also going to try to put a, a copy or two on reserve in the library um, on campus. But uh, I had some, some, met some challenges when I did, tried to do it this morning. So it'll be there 
hopefully by next class. And if not, you guys can, uh, should nag me if you, if you want it and it's not on reserve in the library. Okay, any questions? Okay. Um, okay, what else is there that I want to talk about? I'm going to keep going through the written syllabus now. Um, the grading, in this course, we're going to have 5% of your grade is going to be based on daily problems. One, one sheet you're going to find on the uh, course webpage is the, uh, a list of daily problems. For every class period, I have selected one problem, generally from the book, and uh, your job is to, uh, before class, you will um, do the daily problem and submit it to, uh, over Blackboard. Um, now, these problems, the daily problems are not going to be graded. They are going to be counted. Okay, and so the number of people, who, you know, the number of problems you uh, turn in over the course of the semester will be, uh, that will be the source of the 5% of your grade that daily problems are. 5% is not a lot of your grade, but on the other hand, I have, whenever I've done studies of correlations of how many people turn in daily problems, you know, how many problems people turn in and how they do on the exams, there is a very, very strong correlation. Um, you know, the, the, ideally when you do a daily, with a daily problem, you will review what we did last class and maybe figure it out or maybe get stuck. But once you understand the problem, then when I go through at the beginning of each class, I will go th through the, 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 previous, the, the, the daily problem for that class. And you can see where you went wrong, where you got stuck, how I was thinking about it. And I think that that's a great way to learn how to, to think about algorithm problems. There's a way of thinking about these things. And, um, and I think the daily problems are a key to doing well in this class, okay? The actual credit you get for turning it in is not that much, but it's a key. And we're not going to grade what you turn in. So some of you may be saying, ha ha, I can turn in a blank sheet and they're going to count it. And you're right, but I don't think that the blank sheets are the reason the people did better when they turned it in. Okay, the people who, you know, who think about the problem, maybe don't get, get, get all the way. Okay, but at least, you know, are trying to think of how they would do it. I think that's a very important thing. Okay, so I strongly encourage people to take the daily problems seriously. There will be five homework problem assignments in here. Um, the total grade for homework uh, assignments is 15% of your grade. Um, four of these program, um, the, the homework assignments are going to be solving a bunch of book problems. Um, and the homework assignments are allowed to be done in pairs. I think that it is good if a team, people work together with someone on a homework assignment. Because again, trying to understand these problems, it's often good to bounce it off somebody else and figure it out. Now anybody who's saying, ah, I'm going to get a smart partner and he's going to do all the problems or she's going to do all the problems. The way I, that's okay with me because I'm going to nail you on the exams. The bulk of the grade for this course is the, the two midterms, each of which is 25%, and the final, which is 30%. And a large chunk of the problems of, of, the, of the midterm is solving problems like that on the homeworks, okay? In fact, what I think I'm going to guarantee, okay, is that because this is a, a, the first time I've used a textbook, all the written problems on the midterms and final I am hoping will be exercise, so there's homeworks from the chapters we're covering. Not ones I have assigned, but problems that are in the book. Okay? So a terrific way to really get prepared for here is to understand this stuff well enough that you can solve, you know, basically all the homework problems, all the problems on, in the chapters uh, online. If you do that, you're going to have a great, do great on here. Okay? Um, but the problems are kind of important, okay, for, for understanding things. 
the midterms and final are where the bulk of the grade is. Any questions about the grade breakdown? Okay, um, I think that's basically the uh, story here. Um, and uh, about the exams, I do not give makeup exams or makeup midterms. So if students, you know, you know so, some, some disaster befalls you and you cannot show up for the exam, for, for one of the midterms, I will average your other midterm and final. But notice that things usually get progressively harder. So, so someone who's missing the early midterms, this is bad, a bad idea, early midterm, this is a bad idea, okay? It is important that everybody you know, show up for the midterms you won't get a second crack at a midterm. Any questions? Okay. Um, and we will see. Um, what else did I want to say on here? Oh, one thing about the midterms that's very, very important is that my midterms and finals are designed to be hard. The average in my midterms is always, almost always, in the 60s. Okay? Now, I see some people getting depressed. Does that mean a reason to be depressed? The answer is no, because I am going to be curving this thing. So if the median is, uh, what you call it, a, let's say the median on the midterm was a 65, would you be failing if you got a 65? No, you would be a median student. What is the median student in this class going to get, course going to get? A B minus. Okay, so it's important not to get wrapped up in the absolute numbers, but you will get wrapped up, should get wrapped up in the relative numbers and where you are. Okay, so I, tip, I give the median, the way I give final grades is the median average gets a B minus and I, you know, you know, basically push things out here. Okay, I know that it is bad for people to get a, below a C in a required course. So if you do all the homeworks, you do, you know, you, you, you do your best. If I see evidence of trying, I will definitely try not to give anybody below a C. If I see the evidence of, of taking the course seriously throughout. Some, there's usually a few people who don't do that, and that's unfortunate. But uh, any questions about that? Any questions about the midterm? So this is important. Some people will, will take the midterm come out saying, oh my God, I'm failing, I got a 60. If you got a 60, are you failing? No. Are you below average? Slightly, okay. Is that where it's gonna end? The course, the midterm grades, I expect to range between the 90s and the 20s, okay? If this is a typical class in a typical semester, okay? And are the people in the 20s failing? Yes, the people in the 20s are failing, okay? But the other people, you know, so, un so, so don't panic, but understand that, that there is going to be hard midterms and exams, and uh, there will be a curve. Any questions about that? Okay, that's good to know. Um, what else will I say? The um, lectures are supposedly being recorded by uh, Echo 360 and will be on Blackboard. I encourage someone try it out after the class today and make sure that this works. I think I have succeeded in making this visible to people, but, uh, but uh, I, I would like confirmation and that, that things like the audio was recorded and that uh, everything was good. Um, and, uh, you know, take a look at that. Um, I have, the, if you look at the syllabus, I show you what the web page is. This is where all the lecture notes and assignments are. That's where you should live. Now, um, we are using Piazza for the discussion board in this class, which I trust everybody is probably kind of familiar with. Um, so the Piazza link is given here. It's, I guess, piazza.com slash stonybrook full 2021 CS mat 360 73. If you go to the course webpage, you should see it. It's definitely in the syllabus. I strongly encourage for next class, everybody be registered for Piazza. 
This is a good way to ask questions about homework or about what's going on in class and stuff like that. Any questions about that? Now, I'm a little bit confused with Piazza in that it has somehow um, morphing to a more commercial model than what I was used to before. And as far as I can tell, everything is fine for you guys to use it. If there is something that is annoying because it's not adequately paid for or something like that, let me know, because I'm, I'm, I'm oblivious to this. But I'm hoping and assuming that it will work fine unless I hear anybody else. Any questions about that? OK. Um, again, I recommend that you work with, you, you solve your, do the homeworks with a partner. Now, um, the partner system requires a certain level of maturity, OK? I want you to find your own partners, ideally, OK? If your partner is a louse and won't help you or, 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 or something like this, break up with your partner. That's not a problem. And find a different partner, OK? Um, you, some of you could advertise on Piazza for partners, OK? I may at some point in class, if somebody asks me, you know, uh, a few weeks into the first assignment, oh, I need a partner. I, I might ask everybody who's looking for a partner to stand up, and then people might make marriages. So I might be willing to act as a broker, but I don't want to act as a marriage counselor, okay? If you don't, aren't getting along with your partner, break up with them, okay? Any questions about the partner strategy? One other rule I have with the, um, with the uh, homeworks is people are allowed to turn in one homework late by one week. If there is a problem, sometimes people's dog dies, sometimes there's something that happens, okay? So if you are late, if this, you need that week, you can have a one-week extension on one assignment, okay? I don't need you to, um, what you call it? I don't want any, uh, de you know, I don't, you don't ask me. You just write on the assignment, I am turning this one in late, okay? And we will, the TA will keep count and there will only be one such thing allowed. Now, you do not have to turn one in late. You don't have to use your extension. Or if you save your extension for the last one, you can, that extension is good till the final. So, so that's actually a great time to use it if the dog doesn't die or there isn't a big problem, okay? So I recommend that, uh, you know, but I'm not going to give you a second extension. So the dog cannot die twice or anything like that. You get one extension and that's it. Any questions? Okay. Um, now what else are we going to be dealing with? Recognize, now we, we, what in the way, of, if you are a TA for this course, I'm not sure how many of them are showing up. If you're a TA, come on down. Okay, Just come on down, show me who you are, and let's introduce you. Okay, again, we strategically guarded all points of the room, it looks like, so that nobody can uh, get past the TA without noticing. Okay, so now what we've got here, I believe, is a mix of... Um, Grad and, uh, of grad and undergrad TAs, okay, and, 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 and a grader. So tell them what your name is and what your, uh, what your, what flavor you are, grad TA, undergrad, or uh, grader. I'm Dylan, I'm an undergrad TA. Dylan, undergrad TA. Uh, my name is Madan, I'm an undergrad TA. Undergrad TA. And I'm Fatima, I'm the undergrad TA. Okay, Fatima, right? Right, and you're the grad TA, right? Okay, it's, okay, and yes. I'm a grad TA. Okay, now Fatima is the head TA, okay, um, which which means that that uh, that that there may be certain things that I will say, talk to the head TA, okay, about, okay, and Fatima will be the one of that. Okay, I will be, we haven't completely synced yet, okay, and, and I will be just getting, organizing something with what our missions are, okay, sometime within a week or so. Okay, but in the meantime, give a round of applause to the TA. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, uh, now recognize that there is a lot of grading and a lot of stuff here, 
So I need patience with the TAs. Um, one thing that uh, I don't like and that I strongly discourage are regrades on homeworks and regrades on exams, okay? And when it comes to exams, I will go through the problems. Students are often convinced their answer is right until they see a right answer, okay? And I will try to explain why that is. But, but, but I don't want people hounding TAs for points. I program the TAs that, that they are not supposed to give points back, okay? For things, anything other than an addition mistake, okay? And if the TAs give points back, they're supposed to talk to me and justify that, okay? This is designed so that people do not feel that an important part of their life is trying to get extra points from the TAs. Obviously, on the homeworks, the homeworks count for 15%. That means a total of 3% per homework. If each homework has 10 problems, regrading one of these programs is big O X problems is big O of nothing on your grade. Okay? On the exams, you know, we carefully grade the exams. We grade the homeworks less carefully, but I make sure we grade the exams carefully. Unless you have a right answer, okay, on an exam that we mark wrong, there will be no extra credit, okay? Sometimes people have a clever new way of solving this problem that I didn't know, okay? Very occasionally, okay? If so, I'm willing to contemplate those kind of things on a midterm, or, okay? On the other hand, oh, you took off seven points, and this was only four points wrong. That is the job of the TA to grade. Does everybody kind of see that? Your answer is right or it is wrong. If it is wrong, you get what the TA gave you. Any question about that? Okay, that's important to me. Um, what else is there? Again, I have the daily problem, and that's good. Okay, when you work with, your, uh, with a, um, what you call it, the, uh, on the homeworks, you, you learn in one solution per pair. You do not have to, uh, you, you should turn in one paper per pair. So the two of you sign the same paper and turn it in. You're not supposed to recopy the problems, okay? So I'm willing to let you, that's the way it should be, okay? Um, and I don't want any solutions to your problems to be more than one side of a sheet of paper per problem. Because again, the goal is to try, and I, the, the goal of those homeworks is to make sure that you learn this stuff, not that you try to impress us. Any questions? Okay, um, I have a, uh, on my website, uh, uh, algorist.com, there is a solution wiki to some, where I let students post solutions to certain problems of the, uh, you know, uh, in the book. Now, I never check any of these solutions. Many of these solutions are wrong. Many of these solutions are dumb, okay? Um, they're not supposed to be complete, okay? You may use that resource if you wish to help you, but recognize that that is not the word of God, okay? And that I'm very happy to mark off a solution copied from the wiki, okay? You're not supposed to copy solutions from the wiki in the first place, okay? But um, you may find that, I, what I strongly recommend is people think hard about trying to solve a problem <clears throat> before you go to the wiki. Because it's sort of like in these problems, there's often a trick. And once you see the trick, oh yeah, well, now, now I see the trick, okay? You, you have to kind of be able to come up with the trick yourself, okay? And the way that you do that is by learning to beating on it seeing what things you fall into, and then maybe you can appreciate the trick better. Okay, any questions? Um, there should be no graduate students in this course. If you're a graduate student, you should let me know at, right after class, but, um, and I'm gonna try to get you out, but uh, hopefully there's none of them that have slithered in here. Um, <coughs> um, as far as other notices from the, uh, um, what you call it, from the uh, um, syllabus, I would like to say that, again, if, if you have a disability, 
you should work with the Dis Disabled Student Services um, Office. Many of you, you know, probably if you have one, you're probably aware of it. But I remember I once taught a course, and halfway through the semester, we discovered one of the students was deaf, okay? And, you know, that's something that, that you know, if you have an issue, you should be dealing with the Disabled Student Services uh, Organization. That's one bit of uh, news. Um, there's the disclaimer, there's the, the statement about academic dishonesty. Um, you know, if there is cheating in this class, I will pursue it according to the rules that are in the, um, you know, the handbook. The usual cheating that I catch is people cheating on the exams, copying off the guy next to you, okay? okay we got a couple people that way. Um, occasionally, you see somebody trying to break in and steal something, okay? But uh, again, I encourage people to be honest. We will use the university standard um, academic honesty uh, procedures if something happens. Okay. Um, and as far as other comments, um, one last thing is that I try in my lectures to make things fun with jokes and analogies and things like this. Um, I always fear. I like talking on my feet, and you know, and. On the other hand, I always fear someday I'm going to say something very stupid. And uh, so if I say anything that offends anybody, I want you to come back and talk to me. I will apologize, and I want to make sure I know what, what the issue was. Okay? So, um, you know, uh, so please let me know if there is a, you know, if, if I say anything that uh, is unfortunate. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, fair enough. Uh, okay. The other thing I hope to do, which I usually do, although um, with this COVID thing, it's always a little tricky. I try to have pizza with the prof sessions with uh, students when I teach this class, where at some point I'll announce a sign-up sheet on my door, and I, I will have a session where I might have 15, up to 15 students over for pizza. O up to over means, you know, in the building, CS building. Um, but uh, I'm a little bit wary of this still with the COVID thing, so I'm not sure, completely sure whether I'll do it. If someone reminds me, probably starting in October, we'll, we'll check that out. Any questions? Okay. Any questions about any of the syllabus, any about the, any of the rules? <clears throat> okay, good. What else do I got here? Hold on. Let me use this thing. Okay, so this is the uh, syllabus of the course, the flow of the semester. We're going to start out for the first three lectures or so doing introductory material, uh, discussing what algorithms are, why correctness is important, um, the big O notation. How many people here love the big O notation? And people don't love the big O notation. Okay, I see a little bit more twitching. Um, but we're gonna, that's something that's very important for us when it comes to analyzing algorithms. We'll go through that and make sure we, we understand that. We'll talk about properties of logarithms, because logarithms, uh, you know, turn out to be a very important part of algorithm analysis. Getting algorithms where you change a linear term to a logarithmic term is a big win. And uh, that's what we'll do. We're then going to review, um, have sections where we're going to review um, the basic, uh, review data structures. Um, now, I know you should have taken CSE 214. Um, we're going to review data structures at a high level. But I think that knowing about, uh, you know, what trees are and why trees are good, understanding how hashing works, um, these are important things. And other data structures like priority queues, you know, heaps, Things like that. Then we're going to be talking about um, sort, you know, sorting. One of the great things about sorting is that a lot of different algorithm ideas come out as, out as a consequence of sorting algorithms. And we'll talk about that. And that's the material up to midterm one. Okay? So some of that you, may, you would have had in 214, but we're going to look at it probably differently. Okay? more conceptual, less programming, okay? 
but, um, but you have to understand it in the details to work on it. Okay, any questions about that? Then there'll be the first midterm. After the first midterm, we're going to spend uh, six lectures on graph algorithms. Things like shortest path and minimum spanning tree and, uh, you know, um, algorithms based on depth first search, uh, these kind of things. Graph algorithms are very, very important. Um, and get into sort of correctness issues that you probably don't usually see in some of the data structures. The correctness of data structures is usually obvious. The time complexity may not be. In graph algorithms, the complexity, the, the, you know, the, the, the correctness is often very, very subtle. And we'll go through that. Then we're going to have a uh, quick unit on combinatorial search. That means, you know, brute force search backtracking. Some algorithm problems can always be solved by doing, searching through all possible solutions. The good news is it's correct. The bad news is it's inefficient. The good news is if you are clever enough, you can often do a more efficient search than, than, than someone who's not clever. And um, homework four is going to be a, the one assignment you're not going to work on with a partner. It's going to be a program where you, uh, we're going to have a contest where uh, the fastest program wins. Okay, a prize. The slowest program will win a prize, but you don't want that one. Okay, for solving a particular uh, problem using combinatorial search and uh, <coughs> backtracking, and uh, we'll, we'll do that. Um, then we're going to talk about uh, dynamic programming. Dynamic programming is a uh, kind of an, un an unusual algorithm paradigm in that once you understand dynamic programming, it's a very, very powerful, easy idea. That said, students have a very tough time understanding it until suddenly something drops. Okay? And uh, so we're going to try to teach about finding edit distance, other dynamic programming things. And that's going to occupy three or four lectures. Then we will have the second midterm. Okay? And uh, after the second midterm, which is probably around Thanksgiving, we will end on a unit on um, NP completeness. It turns out that some algorithm problems do not have fast solutions. And uh, what's amazing is you can take certain algorithm problems and prove that there is no fast algorithm for it. Proving that something doesn't exist is kind of an amazing thing if you think about it. I mean, um, do unicorns exist? Does anybody here think unicorns exist? One. Who here does not think unicorns exist? Looks like the majority think unicorns exist. Okay, maybe there's two there who don't think unicorns exist. So it's two to one. But if I were going to prove that unicorns didn't exist, how would I do that? You kind of have to look everywhere for it, right? How do we know it's not behind that door? Okay. But there's a way to kind of prove that certain algorithm problems do not have fast algorithms. Not just that, that you're too dumb to find it, but that there isn't one. And being able to think about those problems is really kind of an amazing thing. And that's what we're going to end the course on. Any questions about any of the topics or anything like that? So these are roughly the schedule of the assignments. The one thing to note is that I sometimes will assign a homework before the midterm and make it due after the midterm. But part of that homework will be questions that will be relevant to the midterm. So you should expect to do that part of the assignment before the midterm to benefit from it. Any questions? OK, good. Let me keep going. Boom. Um, again, this is my disclaimer. If there's anything I say that makes someone uncomfortable, let me know. Any questions? Okay, good. Okay, so if that's the case, I'd like to now start on uh, the course material. And I want to start talking about what an algorithm actually is. And uh, 
how you, how, how you deal with, you know, wh what are we talking about in this class and what are we thinking about? Um, the way I think of what an algorithm is, is an algorithm is kind of the idea that underlies a computer program. Okay, it's a way of getting some kind of j problem done. And, um, you know, there's something, if you have a sorting program in assembly language, and a sorting program in uh, Python or, 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 or C or whatever your other languages are, something is the same between these different programs. And that thing that stays the same is the algorithm, the idea, the method. Um, and for algorithms that we're going to be talking about in here to be interesting, they have to solve very specific problems where input and output are well-defined. The word algorithm has kind of gotten corrupted a little bit. Occasionally people will talk about the Google algorithm. What is the Google algorithm? What does it do? Well, it does whatever Google wants it to do, right? It's not a well-defined, there's not a well-defined problem. You know, find, find a good web page for me, okay? But it changes every day what they mean by a good web page and it's always they hire more and more students and they, they, they beat on it, okay? For an algorithm that we're talking about is specified, actually, let me just think of something. Okay, that might be better. Um, the algorithm that I'm talking about in here, okay, we're talking about a uh, problem where you specify what the I possible inputs are, you specify what the, the properties that the output must have, and the algorithm is a procedure to map input to output. What do I mean by that? Okay, let's consider the algorithmic problem of sorting. Okay, in this class, you're generally going to be given algorithm problems and you're going to be asked, find an algorithm for it that's correct and efficient. What is the problem of sorting? You've undoubtedly seen sorting before. There is an input, which is a sequence of n numbers. There is a desired output, which is a permutation rearranging the numbers so that the i-th number is bigger than the i minus, the i plus first number for all i from 1 to n, okay? And that is a rigorous definition of what the sorting problem is. A sorting algorithm is a procedure that takes, as, takes the input, here are the numbers, the output, and uh, always guarantees a permutation of the numbers in the right order. Any questions? No, when I talk about a sorting problem, about the problem of sorting, I am not talking about giving the numbers 7, 13, 2, 1. That we would call the input to sorting, which we sometimes call an instance of sorting. The algorithmic problem is a big general thing like this. Any questions? Now, we're going to be seeking algorithms that are correct and efficient what we mean by efficient is ultimately going to be defined by the big O notation, okay? The worst case running time in big O notation, okay? And what's interesting is that changes to faster algorithms can beat the difference between fast and slow computers. If you have an N squared algorithm for sorting like bubble sort, and you run it on the hottest piece of machinery in the world, and you compare it to an n log n sorting algorithm, by the time you get to a million entries, okay, you could have that a, a slow computer running the fast algorithm is going to beat the fast, uh, the fast computer running the slow algorithm, okay? If there is a difference in this big O complexity that we're going to talk about, and so, so we are interested in algorithms that are efficient, meaning that the big O complexity is as good as it can be, and we want algorithms that are correct, meaning that on all possible inputs, it produces a legal output, okay? And that's often a hard thing to show. Any questions?
Now, algorithm correctness is not an obvious thing. Okay, and this is if you want a big point from this whole lecture. Okay, actually, first of all, any questions so far? I guess I've been talking too much. I can tell I'm already getting a sore throat. Any, any, any questions or comments so far? Okay, so one of the uh, things to understand is that testing, telling whether an algorithm is correct is not an easy thing. This is the kind of thing that typically needs a proof of correctness. Okay? You guys are used to having programs that are not correct. You write them all the time, right? You, the teacher gives you an assignment, you've got bugs in it. Note that there is a difference between a programming bug, which is kind of a, uh, you know, uh, something you tweak by eventually correcting the program, and an algorithm, an incorrect algorithm. An algorithm, is a, to be correct, is a procedure that must work on all possible inputs, okay, yielding a legal output. Um, and in order to tell whether an algorithm is correct, if the algorithm is remotely interesting, you need a, a proof or an argument of correctness, okay? And, um, you know, this, this is often a, a, a non-trivial thing to do, okay? But that's kind of thing. The important point is sometimes students will come to me, oh, I have an algorithm here. Well, is it right? Oh, it's obvious, okay? And I see some horrible pseudocode with all kinds of, you know, this is the kind of thing you need. It's obvious is not a, word, a, a solution, a proof, okay? You need to have an argument why the thing is correct. Now, in order for an algorithm problem to have a correct algorithm, it has to be well enough specified, okay, to, um, what you call it, to, uh, to, to make clear that there is an argument, a way to, to demonstrate whether you're doing the right thing. So in a network, to find the shortest path from one point to another, that's a well-defined tour. Now, if you ask someone, find me the, the, the route between here and there that's prettiest. Well, unless you have a rigorous definition of what pretty means, that's not a well-defined algorithm problem. Google, when it says, I'm going to show you a web page that I think is good for you, that is probably not a well-defined problem. There is no one at Google who is thinking about proving their search engine is correct. Okay? There probably are many little algorithms involved that have well-defined things that they do use provably correct algorithms on. And there are certain things where they're just kind of playing guesses and, and saying this probably does a good job. Okay? But in this class, we're going to be dealing with an algorithm is either correct or it's wrong. Okay? And to show it's correct, you need an argument. Any questions about correctness? Okay. Um, finally, how do you describe, not finally as in, oh, I get to go soon, but to end this section. Um, to describe an algorithm, how do you describe an algorithm? You're going to have to describe algorithms on your homework assignments and daily problems and exams. What is it? Well, an algorithm is a procedure. It's a sequence of steps. Um, the way that I think is, is best to describe, there's kind of at least three different levels on which people can describe algorithms. One is the choice of, you could write what you're going to do in English for, for selection sort. Find the biggest element in the bunch, pull it out and, and, and move that forward and then repeat. That's English. You could have pseudocode. Pseudocode is something that it's kind of like a programming language you're inventing as you go along. It looks a lot like a programming language. It's got some level of structure to it, okay? But it isn't really a real programming language on a computer. Or you could actually code the thing up and say, look, here it is in Java. This is my algorithm. See this, these two pages of Java code. Now, notice that writing the program, to write a correct program, 
algorithm implementation in a programming language is a lot harder than making vague statements about it in English. Okay, and so there's, you know, in these representations, there's a, an order of precision. Okay? When I'm describing an algorithm, the way that I usually do it is I like to describe the high order ideas in English. Ideally with a picture. Pictures are great. Okay, when you have an exam, drawing a picture is going to be a great thing. Okay, because often I can see what the idea is. Okay, and then for things that are sufficiently detailed, that require some, 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 some more care, expressing it in pseudocode is often a good idea. We'll show you examples of this as time goes by, but I think you should see that, uh, that hierarchy of precision. Okay, any questions? Okay, nothing. I like to have questions, so hopefully with the next que que section I'm going to get some. Any questions? Okay, what I would like to do for the rest of class. Now, class ends, if I understand it correct, the time this class ends is 2.35. Is that correct? And, of course, we will use the big clock to uh, tell that thing. Okay. I'd like to make some of these points about algorithms uh, concrete about correctness and all of these things by giving you an algorithm problem and having you guys try to solve it, okay? And the, the, the problem that I'd like to start with is a problem that uh, I was actually asked by a guy in industry about. There was a local company here who made... Um, Equipment to test printed circuit boards, okay? Now, all of you guys have cell phones, right? I want you to perform a thought experiment. Take the cell phone, smash it on the ground, okay? When you push the pieces aside, you will see a printed circuit board in that phone that will have, um, what you call it? There'll be a little board, there'll be chips on it, this is the back of your printed circuit board. There will be chips, and that they will be uh, hole, there will be holes for where the, the legs on the chips come out. On the other side of the circuit board, I guess you would see that the chips names here. They're usually boxes, right? And this printed circuit board has wires printed that connects certain of these holes, okay, and that that's the wiring that connects, you know, certain logical things from here to the other things. Any questions? People know what I mean by a printed circuit board? These kind of things? So you don't have to smash the phone, okay? Any questions? Okay? Now, this company had a robot that's job it was to test whether or not a printed circuit board was correct. Okay? What does that mean? Remember, there was supposed to be a wire between this peg and this peg. Okay? You could imagine a defective printed circuit board where that was severed. Okay? And then your iPhone wouldn't work right, right? So this company had a, uh, what you call, it? had a robot, okay, whose job it was to, if they had the contract for Apple, take printed circuit boards from iPhones and wanted to explicitly test whether or not every pair of nodes that were supposed to be connected were connected, okay? In particular, I guess on a printed circuit board, there's a especially important connection called, uh, like, voltage, which is the power connection, right? And there's going to be a power connection to basically every one of these pegs. How do I know that there is a path from this power spot to every other dot? What they did was they had a robot with two arms, and the robot would move one arm to the one power source, and then would move the other arm. And when the two arms, both probes touched, it would tell whether electricity flowed between there. 
Does everybody kind of get that idea? So to test whether or not the, um, what do you call it? The, rope, the, the, the circuit board was right, basically involved having a robot arm move to all the points that are supposed to be connected to this. Okay? And actually do tests at every point. Do people, any questions about that? <coughs> Well, what is the problem? If you are uh, doing this, you would like the robot, robots are expensive, and you would like to find what is the tour that visits all the points. Let's say we have a world where there was power, and I have my other finger, everything that's got to get connected to power. These are the, all the points that have to get connected to power. I need to have an order where I visit all the points so I can test all the points, but I want the visiting of these things to be as short a tour as possible. Does everybody see that? The robot, in order to make the robot use efficient, it would be bad if my robot did something like this. Let me see if I can do this. Boom. If I did, beep, robot move here, beep, robot moves here, beep, beep, beep. Does everybody agree that this is going to be a lot slower than a tour that minimizes the length that the robot has to travel? The tour on the left is the drunken tour, or whatever it is, that's going to be a lot slower for the robot than the tour on the right. Does everybody agree? So what is my question? I want you to give me an algorithm that given a set of points, given what's under here, actually I may have the ability to erase this. Uh-oh, let me see if I have the ability to erase this. Oh my God. Okay, that didn't quite do it, but maybe. Given a set of points, find the door that, that minimizes total length. Okay, does everybody see what my problem is? The input you're given is an array of points, x, y's. The output is the ordering of those points to make this tour. How do I find the tour that minimizes the length? Does anybody want to give me an algorithm for this? The input is the points, the output is the order to efficiently visit all those points. Does anyone want to propose an algorithm for that? Does anyone have an idea? Yes? Okay, so you're giving me an idea about something different from points on the inside and on the outside. Okay? And you're saying you want to connect all the outside points to the inside points. I don't know exactly what that means, okay? But I hear you saying something about shortest one, okay? One possibility of what you might be saying, okay, and if not, I'm putting an idea in your head. One idea that you might be saying, let me just double check this, is this right? Is you start on one point and you find which point is closer closest to it. And then you go to all of the other points and you find out which point is closest to it. You find which point, that's not what you want to do. Okay? First you want to create an outline. Okay? Okay, so you want which ones, you want to find which ones are closest to it. And what is the idea? Now that you have this, what are you trying to do with this? That you don't know, okay? And maybe what you're saying is, gee, you're never going to want to go from the, uh, maybe what you're saying, which I'm not sure it's what you're saying, is 
the ins you have to go around the outside. Maybe the inside points, whenever you're nearest to one of the outside points, you make a detour for that. Okay? Now that's going to be wrong. Let's just look at an example where that might be wrong. Uh-oh, this thing is doing me something. Okay, this is now a big problem. Hold on. Oh, I hope this is not. Okay, let me try this again. Hopefully this is doing better. Now, what do I have here? Say I have a big triangle here with three little points. You wouldn't want to make a tour that did something like this. Zoop. And then come back here. Let's say, let's say we had two very close. Uh, maybe, I mean, let's look at this. Just to look at it. I'm not used to dealing with your example. But let's say that I had something that looked like this. There were three tiny points in the middle and three big outside things of two points. A terrible tour would be one that went bzzzt, 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 bzzzt. Does everybody see this? If you're determined to go to the outside points through the inside points, that's probably not the right thing to do in this example. Again, what is the example is to make sure you're seeing, I'm picturing a world where I've got big, these two dots, these two dots, these two dots, and three little ones. What would be probably a bad thing to do? A bad thing would be to say, oh, look, I, that's the nearest thing from the inside to the outside. That's the nearest thing to the inside and the outside. Does everybody agree this would be a bad thing? Okay. Much better would be to take, pay the cost of going out here once, zipping around it, and then getting out. Okay. Anyway, your algorithm is wrong. I can tell you that much. Okay. The algorithm that I was hoping you were going to say, because most people say it, uh-oh, now I'm in big trouble. How do I delete these things? Okay, this is always a challenge to me. Uh, I don't need an out. Oh, wait, boom. Okay, this might be promising, but God knows what it is. Okay, so there's always something weird with these. Okay, this is going to be bad. Hold on. It's like I'm writing with real marker here. How do I get rid of this thing? No. Okay, hopefully this is bad. Maybe I'm going to have to use the board or I'll have to figure this out. Okay, what is another algorithm for solving this robot tour that would seem promising? One might be you start at one point and walk to its nearest neighbor and then walk to its nearest unvisited neighbor and keep doing that. Does everybody see this? This is the one that I think is probably most natural. Usually this is the first thing a class comes up with, right? So if everybody see, this looks like pseudocode, right? It kind of looks like a program, but it uses things like while there are unvisited points. That's not in a pro any programming language I know of, right? Okay, pick a point. While there's unvisited points, visit, find the closest point, and then return, visit it and keep going. So what would we do on the previous example at the risk of uh, having to write on the board again? Oh, I think I know what I'm doing. Okay, now maybe this is... Here, I would find the closest neighbor, find the closest neighbor, find the closest neighbor, closest neighbor, closest neighbor, closest neighbor, 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 neighbor. You see what I'm doing here? Constantly finding the closest neighbor and then go back there. Okay? Is this algorithm correct? Well, it's going to find me a tour, but it is not necessarily going to find me the shortest tour. Now let me just see if I can blow this away. Okay, this, this, I think my erasure work is going to need some help. Um, Here's an example where the closest tour idea, the nearest neighbor idea, does really badly. Suppose I start from this point at a distance that's at, at x equals zero. 
I have two choices. I could go to, they have two nearest neighbors to it. One at x equals one, one at x equals minus one. Suppose I go to x equals one. Then I've got two points that are a distance two from it. The one at three and the one at minus one. Does everybody see that I might take the one at minus one? Now I've got two, two um, points, <clears throat> one a distance four away, the other a distance four away. Does everybody see that at every point here I've got two nearest neighbors that I haven't visited? If I pick the wrong one, I'm going to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. This tour is going to obviously be the longer of the bunch. Does everybody agree that this tour, we, we just go all the way to the left and all the way to the right, <clears throat> this is much shorter than the hopscotching tour. So the nearest neighbor algorithm is wrong. Any questions about that? What about if instead I, um, what you call it, always have a start from the leftmost point? What if I have a door that I start from the leftmost point and find the nearest neighbor and find the nearest neighbor and find the nearest neighbor? Is that going to always give me the right robot tour? You either need to give me an argument yes, or you need to show me an example where that's not true. Can anyone show me an example where starting from the leftmost point and going to the near, keep going to the nearest neighbors is not going to be correct? Any ideas? Well, what if you tilt your head by 90 degrees and look at this example? If you tilt your head at 90 degrees, what's the leftmost point? All of them, right? So that you don't know which is the point to start with. Okay. <clears throat> and so there's no reason why you're going to start with the right point. Okay. So both of these algorithms are wrong. Any questions about that? And the way that it's wrong, you show that an algorithm is wrong, the best way is to give me an example where it doesn't do the right thing. Here was an example where nearest neighbor didn't do the right thing. Any questions about that? Any other ideas on how we can find the, the best possible robot tour? Yes? What? Okay, so you're going to say, ha, ha, ha. I can instead go and do, because I'm going to guess that you're probably going to do it. You are going to say, I'm going to try every possible ordering. Okay? Now, what does every possibility mean? You have n points. How many orderings on n points are there? n factorial, right? If you think about it, how many orderings, if I have, um, what you call it? Let's say I have, uh, actually, to be precise, it's a little bit less. Suppose I have um, three choices. How many ways are there of doing it? Well, I could do, actually, three is kind of a funny number, right? One, two, three. Um, I could do one, three, two. Two, one, three. Two, three, one. Three, one, two. Um, what do you call it? Uh, 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 three, two, one, right? Now, because we're dealing with circular tours, if we're dealing with circular tours, tours and all of them are the same, and, and going from A to B is the same as going from B to A, does everybody see that there's only one meaningful way to visit all three points in a circular tour? So it's not quite n factorial, okay? It turns out it is, I believe, n minus one factorial over 2. The 2 comes from the fact that you can go around either from the left or to the right. Okay? And the n minus 1 comes from the fact that you can start from any point and it's going to be the same. Right? 
Pick any point. You might as well start from point number one, right? Because you're going to end up where you started. Okay? Then there are n minus 1 choices for the next point, n minus 2 choices for the next point. So this is something that is something like n minus 1 factorial ish. Okay? Is this going to be a correct algorithm if we enumerate all possible tours, find the cost of each tour, and take the best one? The answer is yes. Is this going to be an efficient algorithm? No. By the time you get to n equals 20, okay, this is going to be unusable on any computer in the world, okay? And by the time you get to 30 or 40 points, okay, this is going to be something that you will never be able to run it, okay? You can take all the world's computers and set it to work, okay? So, exhaustive search has the property that it is correct, but it has the property that it is slow. If something takes n factorial time, or n minus 1 factorial time, or something like that, that is going to be hopelessly slow. It turns out that this problem that we're talking about actually has another name. This problem is known as the traveling salesman problem. And the traveling sa why is it the traveling salesman problem? The story goes, you know, you have a guy, a salesman who's selling something. He has to go door to door. Maybe he's selling rooms or I guess vacuum cleaners. That's what salesmen used to sell door to door. They have a bunch of houses he wants to visit. He wants to find what is the ordering to visit every one of my sales prospects and get back home, okay? using the little least amount of driving, okay? The traveling salesman problem has the property. Not only, no one in this class could find a correct and efficient algorithm, but that's because we will see that there is no correct and efficient algorithm for traveling salesmen. We will see that I ask you to find something that doesn't exist, okay? We'll see that at the end of the semester. Any questions about this exercise? So the issue here was you had a well-defined problem, okay, but trying to find a, um, what you call it, trying to find a, uh, you know, the best possible door is hard. Any questions about that? Yes? Okay, how does Google Maps do it? You're saying, hey, this is a hard problem. How does Google Maps do it? Okay? And I'm going to give you two different answers. First, Google Maps doesn't solve this problem. Google Maps finds the shortest path between two points. Right? Typically, you're specifying the order of where you want to go. I want the best route from Stony Brook to my dorm, from, from my home to my dorm. Now, that is just the shortest path problem. You're not visiting all the points in, the, in, in, in Long Island. You just have two points you care about and you want to visit which ones in between are useful to you. That problem turns out to have a fast algorithm. And we're going to talk about that when we talk about uh, what you call it. We'll, we'll have that, we'll talk about that when we uh, get to graph algorithms. Okay? So the first answer is that um, Google doesn't solve that problem. The other thing is if somebody suddenly decided Google had to solve this problem, they would probably say, okay, I'm willing, I'll do what I can to give them a decent tour, but not necessarily the best possible tour. Okay? And there are um, different algorithms that, that will give you provably decent tours, okay? but are not, that are reasonably fast, okay? But not necessarily the best possible tours, okay? Actually, many of you know Professor Mitchell from Applied Math. The biggest thing he ever did, well, I can talk, talk to him about it, but uh, he actually came up with one of the algorithms that is, can find provably decent tours in reasonably fast times, considering 
you know, for the right definition of pretty decent and fast enough, okay? But in general, we're going to be interested here and not these kind of approximation things. But damn it, you have to either get the right answer or we don't give you any points for not having the right answer. Any questions about that? Okay, let me look ahead a little bit to what I want to do, because there's a big thing I want to deal with. Um, I'm going to give you another example, but I think I want to, which maybe I'll talk about next time, but I want to, maybe I'll go back to the other example. What I want to talk to you about here, because it has to do with the daily problem that you're going to see next class, is this problem of demonstrating incorrectness. Okay? You have an algorithm problem. You'd like to argue that the algorithm problem is not, that your, a particular algorithm for it is not correct. The way to do that is to construct a counterexample. What is a counterexample? It is a, a specific input instance that that algorithm does very badly on. Okay? And being able to tell when an algorithm you guess might be right is wrong by kind of finding a counterexample is a very, very useful skill. Um, so how do you construct bad examples for things? Well, one possibility is try all possible very, very small examples. In the traveling salesman, what would have been the smallest interesting example where an algorithm could go wrong. How many points? You're saying two? Two is probably not an interesting, how can you go wrong? Whoop, whoop, okay? There's no way, or go whoop, whoop, it can't possibly go wrong with two points, right? What's the smallest set of points that you, your, your algorithm can hope to go wrong on? Yeah? Four, okay? If you're looking for a circular turf, four points is probably a good thing. If I want to break your algorithm, maybe I should try all possible ways of making four points. What does that mean? Well, maybe putting them in a convex position. Maybe having three points and one in the center. Maybe having three points and one near it, okay? Maybe having one point and three out there. Okay? Trying small examples, many of your bad algorithms are so bad, they will break for the smallest possible size where they can hope to break. Okay? So I encourage you to think about that. I encourage you to think about worlds where there's ties. If you looked at the example that I gave you before, there were, um, what you call it, the reason why the nearest neighbor thing broke was because you had two choices. It always go to the closest point. Well, if there are two closest points, then your procedure has to pick one. If it picks the wrong one, you've trapped it in Never Never Land, right? So being able to think about ties to find um, counterexamples is a good idea. And thinking about mixes of big and small, I think, on a big level. That's what I was kind of trying to do over here, right? I had big distances and I had tiny little points forming a cluster, okay? Being able to take a, an algorithm and look for, uh, an, you know, uh, counterexamples is a good idea. Any questions? Okay, one last slide that I'm going to cover today is um, just because you can't find a counterexample does not mean an algorithm is correct, okay? If you have an algorithm you're proposing, you think hard about why it's wrong, you can't find a why, why it's wrong, that does not mean it's correct. Um, if it's not correct, then you've got to give a proof that it's correct. And how do you prove things are correct? Um, one technique that you've probably seen in, uh, they've undoubtedly seen in 215 or some other classes here, are uh, recursion and in, uh, induction. Mathematical induction 
is a way of proving that things are correct by breaking it down into smaller cases. Okay? I assume everybody here has seen mathematical induction, right? <clears throat> if you wanted to prove that something like, what's the sum of this equal to this? If you want to prove something like that by induction, what is the basic flow of that kind of argument? First, you demonstrate that it's true for extremely small cases. n equals 1, n equals 0. You then assume that it's true in general, up to some, just below some value n. And then you say, can I argue that, um, what you call it, that, that by adding um, one more example, can I argue that for n points, it's got to be true using the fact that the, that, that, that the statement is true for up to n minus 1 points? Maybe you could have proved that an algorithm is correct if you could show that for all examples on three points, it's correct. You assume it's true for all examples up to n minus 1 points. And then you ask yourself, well, it's got to be true for n points, because if I take one point out of this example, I get an example where it will be right, and I know exactly how to fix it for this extra point. So induction is one of these things that you learned about, okay, that is a technique for proving things correct. We will use it at different points. <clears throat> But remember that this is one of the things you learned about as a way to prove something correct. Any questions? Any questions? Now, so how many of you liked doing mathematical induction? How many of you disliked doing mathematical induction? Okay, the people that disliked it are on this side of the room for some reason. Okay? Now, the one idea, I want you to go and think about mathematical induction a little bit. But I want you to realize that, th that, that there's an intimate connection between recursion and induction. How did recursive programs work? You usually had a program, you know, uh, who knows, foo, and foo of n. And what did you do? You called foo on a smaller thing. And you did some other stuff to patch it up. That was, in, that was a recursion, right? You solve this problem by using smaller examples. Induction, okay, is a, kind of the same idea. You want to prove what the value of phu of n is, given that we know what phu of n minus 1 is. Okay? There's an intimate example connection between induction and recursion. And so induction is a good idea for trying to prove recursive programs correct. That may be a vague thing, but we'll see more of it later. Any questions? OK, so for next class, I need you to go and submit the answer before class next time to the first daily problem. And we will resume with algorithm stuff next class. OK, thanks for your attention. I will see you guys then.